Now we are turning this morning to the beginning of a new series in the prophecy of Haggai, and I want to invite you to turn there to the first chapter of Haggai, and we are going to read there the first two verses. Haggai is a very short prophecy of only these two chapters, easily lost. The easiest way to find it, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, is to come to the end of it, the prophecy of Malachi, then the chapters of Zechariah, and you'll find the little prophecy of Haggai immediately before that. Our sermon series is entitled, Putting the Church Back Together Again, and we will soon see how appropriate that is as a title, and the title of our study this morning, as you would see from the order of service, Tell God He Can Wait. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, who was the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. There is often something very mysterious about the way in which God raises up messengers and makes their lives and ministries significant at a particular time in history, and that was undoubtedly true of the prophet Haggai. One of the things that God has sometimes done in history, and He has done it particularly in our own country of Scotland, is to raise up men whose lives and Christian ministries have often been apparently very ordinary and suddenly and inexplicitly made them quite extraordinary. A hundred and forty years ago in the land of Wales, there was a preacher by the name of David Morgan. His preaching was nothing particularly out of the ordinary. But then something happened to David Morgan, and he himself put it like this. He said, one night I went to bed like a lamb, and I woke up like a lion. And sometime after that, that unusual anointing that God had given him for a special time was apparently withdrawn. And he said, I went to bed one night as a lion, and I woke up again like a lamb. There are in the ministries of those who are known to us seasons in which it seems God turns them into lions, and something unusual and special takes place that is never again repeated. It has very little to do necessarily with their own personal growth in grace. It has very little, if anything, to do with their age. It frequently happens to those who are younger rather than to those who are older. But there are times when God seizes one of His servants and does something totally unexpected through them. And that was undoubtedly true of this man Haggai. We know very little about him. We know less about him, in fact, than we know about most prophets. We know that he was just known as the prophet. The way those of you who occasionally watch or have caught Mrs. Mack on the high road, at least it used to be in the dim and distant days when I occasionally saw bits of it, she would refer to the minister. And that's what Haggai was. He was the prophet, and everybody probably in Jerusalem knew him. That was his role in their society. But suddenly, God took hold of this man Haggai, 
and for four months of his life and ministry turned him into something extraordinary and different. It seems that like David Morgan, he went to bed one night like a lamb and he woke up like a lion. And then in view of the silence of Scripture about the rest of his ministry, he may well have gone to bed in December of the year 520 like a lion and awakened the next day. And once again, he was simply Haggai, the local prophet. And in that four-month period, he preached a series of sermons that were to prove a turning point in the whole life of the nation. Let me, as we begin to study his prophecy, say something by way of background to what he was engaged in. A hundred years before King Nebuchadnezzar had come from Babylon, besieged Jerusalem, and had virtually destroyed the city in a series of raids from the year 605 until 20 years later in the year 586. It's the situation that we read about in the first chapter of the book of Daniel. The cream of the nation's future had been taken into exile in Babylon. And then as later on the people had resisted Nebuchadnezzar, he had come again and then he had come again and he had virtually destroyed the city. He had ruined the walls. He had destroyed the royal palace. And particularly, he made a focus of his attention to destroy the temple of God, which was the symbol of God's presence, the place where God's people looked constantly for encouragement and for direction. But in the year 539, as God had in fact promised through the prophet Jeremiah, And through the prophet Isaiah, God, all unknown to him, raised up Cyrus to be an instrument of his people's recovery and restoration. And as we read, for example, in the opening chapter of the book of Ezra, which describes roughly this time, Cyrus had issued a decree enabling people to return from exile to their homeland and to build for their gods city walls, and temples. And so the walls of the city, as some of us have been studying in the book of Nehemiah recently, the walls of the city were built. And work, as the book of Ezra tells us, began on the rebuilding of the temple. That work had begun to proceed, as we're told, in Ezra chapter 3 and into chapter 4. The people had become eager to take part in this great enterprise. When they laid the foundations, there was tremendous rejoicing. They sang together, He is good as the Lord. His love to Israel endures forever. But then things began to go wrong. Things began to happen. When God is on the move, the Scriptures constantly remind us things begin to happen to hinder the work of our Lord in building His church. And Ezra tells us how two things happened. First of all, those whose hearts were not really one with the people of God came to the people of God and said, let us share this work with you. We know how to do these things. We have skills that you need. And they saw it in this way by deceit, by outward expression of the fact that they wanted to see God's glory, but hearts that were far more interested in themselves and their own position. They wanted to nestle in with God's people with the purpose, of course, of diverting God's glory from Himself to themselves. And thankfully, the people of God were not taken in by that deceit, and they refused any alliance that would in any way hinder giving all of the glory to Jehovah, their God. But then there was a second tactic which was employed, and 
While deceit failed, this tactic was profoundly successful. It was the tactic of discouragement. Keeping snapping away at the heels of God's people as they began this work and doing everything they possibly could to discourage that work from going on. Listen to what we are told in Ezra chapter 4. The peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired, listen to this, counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus. They didn't do their own dirty work, you notice. They got hold of others who would do their dirty work. And their dirty work was to discourage the people of God from pressing on with the calling that God had given to them. And if the New Testament sheds any light on this, the light it sheds is this, that there are many weapons that may fail against the building of the church of Jesus Christ in any part of the world but a weapon that frequently succeeds is the weapon of discouragement, of ongoing discouragement, pulling back, pulling down of the people of God. And it wasn't long before the sound of the mason's hammer was no longer heard in the temple precincts. The people were so discouraged that the great church building program to which God had called his people seemed to fall to the ground. And for well over a decade, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Until God, in an unusual way, brought together a group of people. Three of them are mentioned here in the opening section of Haggai. Another figure is the great figure of that man Ezra. There were doubtless others who were involved, but very especially this little book points us to the contribution that the prophet Haggai made to putting the church of God back together again. It was, as far as we know, the only great thing that was ever accomplished through his ministry but his ministry could scarcely have accomplished anything more wonderful. And the great thing is, really, I suppose, I suspect he may have been quite elderly by this time from some of the things that are said throughout the book. The great thing was, when the time came, he was ready. When the time came, he was fully equipped. And so on the first day of a new month, In our dating, it would have been the 29th of August in the year 520. He must have been one of those people who preach sermons and then write the date and the place on the side. Mr. Duncan, one of our former ministers, used to do that. And he knew exactly when the Spirit of God had come upon his word and something new and unusual had happened. And he preached this sermon at least at first to a very small congregation, these two men of whom we read in the opening two verses, this man Zerubbabel who was the governor and this man Joshua who was the high priest. If I can put it in Presbyterian terms, his congregation was the elders and the members of the congregational board. And he gathered them together because they were the ones who had special responsibility for the building of the church of God in their time. And he spoke to them this staggering message. These people say, God is saying to us, these people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be rebuilt. Notice a couple of things about these words of Haggai as we begin our study of his prophecy. The first is this, and it is so obvious, but so worth re-emphasizing. It is the sheer sense of authority that marks his ministry. Like Elijah, he comes as one who has stood in the presence of God. 
and listen to the voice of God. Like Amos, another prophet, he has stood in the presence of God and the Lord has revealed his own secret purposes to him. But the thing that's so special about Haggai is that conscious that God is going to speak to the people through him, he expresses his authority in a very striking way. He comes as the messenger of the Lord of hosts, literally. In the NIV, the Lord Almighty. He's coming as the mouthpiece of the great King of the ages, the Lord of his people. And the language he uses literally says this. This message, this word of the Lord, is coming by the hand of Haggai. He sees himself almost as a kind of divinely sent postman who has the right name, the right address, and the right postmark upon the message. And the people, as we shall see, become conscious that on the one hand God has prepared his servant for this time and God is working in their hearts to enable them to respond to his message in this time. And the message is simply this. God is speaking to you and he's delivering his message to you as a people and as individuals as really and definitely as though he handed you a letter himself. Haggai is God's postman to the people. And it's clear from the response that we shall see there is to his preaching that the people become conscious that their name is on his sermon. And their names individually are upon his sermon. Just as is always the case when God's word is preached and opened up to us in the power of the Holy Spirit, we may be in a gathering of hundreds as we are today, but we become as conscious of God speaking to us individually as though the only people here were the Lord and ourselves. And we recognize that He's saying things to us that no expositor of God's Word, no preacher could possibly know about us. We may divert it in all kinds of ways, as people sometimes do when they say to preachers, who's been gossiping to you about me? And the fact is, nobody has. But there is that consciousness that the message of God has been, as it were, parceled up particularly for us, and the Holy Spirit comes to us as we sit under its influence, and He tears open the wrapping, and He gives us the parcel of God's Word that is specifically intended for us. And as we listen, the Spirit leads us down avenues of application to our own lives that nobody else knows about. It is part of God's kindness to us, dear friends, that He does this. That He's not interested in the technological revolution of exposing our sins and having them put up the way they can put up things you know now on the motorways. And if you're speeding, they'll put your number up. God could do that. God could do that. He could put your number up and expose the secrets of your heart. He could do that. But the reason we are glad to place our lives under the ministry of His Word is because He comes through His servants as postman. And His message usually is wrapped up in an envelope that is sealed and no one else knows. And He comes through the prophet Haggai and He speaks with this anointing of God that makes people see and feel, this is for me. He's speaking to me. He cares about me. He knows me through and through. Well, there is a sense of authority in his ministry. But the second thing there is here in these opening verses, and particularly in verse 2, is this stark exposing of the people's lethargy. This is what the Lord Almighty says. 
Now notice the language. It is characteristic of the Lord in the Old Testament when he comes to his people with an affectionate heart to say, my people, my people. But that's not the language here. The language here is a finger of accusation. These people. These people who are behaving as though they were not my people is the implication. These people are saying the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And they knew as soon as they opened the letter, they knew that they were a people exposed by the all-seeing eye of the Lord of hosts. What was happening? Well, from the very language Haggai uses as he brings this accusation of the Lord against them, it seems in some ways that their outward expressions of piety masked an inner difference to spiritual reality. The language they used, the time has not yet come. It sounded so spiritual. It's not the Lord's time, they were saying. When the Lord wants us to do these things, we'll recognize His hand, we'll know His time. They were actually really saying to the prophet and to God's people and to God, we are men who understand the times. We were thinking of the men's group on Friday night about those men of Issachar in the book of Chronicles who understood the times and knew what to do. And that was really the language these people were using. They'd got it from the Bible. They understood the times. And the time, they said, hadn't come. But the time had long come. We need to pray about it. No, they didn't need to pray about it. When it comes to a commandment of God to build a temple and to keep that temple, you don't need to pray about what God's will is. You just need to do it. And to speak spiritually about your disobedience and your indifference is to mask a deep sickness in your Christian life. That's what the prophet was saying. What corresponds to that today? I suppose this. The church of Jesus Christ in our land is like a bride wearing rags. Is my response to that to say it's not the time. When the time comes, I'll give my all. How can you say that to the Lord when He calls you to give your all now, now? Their outward piety masked an inner indifference. But more than that, their spiritual language, a language masked an inner contempt. They spoke of the Lord's house. Interesting, isn't it, how we do that? Other people speak about the church, and we know better, so we speak about the Lord's house. We have our own vocabulary that we've learned in Zion, and they were well able to use it. But the use of the right vocabulary masked an inner contempt. You remember what the Old Testament says and what is fulfilled in Jesus, that as you watched him, there was a verse in the Bible that came into your mind. Zeal for his father's house consumed him. That was Jesus being the model man of God. Zeal for his father's house consumed him. And actually in the Bible, they're speaking about the literal temple, the house of God. Jesus was zealous for the glory of God to be seen in that building. But that was the kind of behavior for which these people held an inner contempt. Some of them despised God inwardly. And they thought nobody knew it. And then the letter was delivered by postman Haggai, and as they opened it up, 
the thing that gripped them was that God had known all along. Their outward piety masked an inner indifference. Their spiritual language masked an inner contempt. And their show of wisdom masked a spirit of procrastination, putting it off. The time, they said, has not yet come. There they were, back to their old self-deceit. Sometime, sometime the time will come and I will rise to the occasion, but the time is not yet. And Haggai is saying to them, if you're not rising to the occasion now, you can forget about rising to the occasion in the future. With respect to the building of the church of God, the people of Jesus Christ, either in the Old Testament period or in the New Testament period. If you're not rising to the occasion today, you can certainly have no assurance that you will rise to the occasion tomorrow. Self-deceit today will lead to self-deceit tomorrow. And here... Postman Haggai delivers the letter and they open it up and as they read it, these leaders of God's people, they see that God's known the truth about them all along. He knows their hearts. And he's coming to them in his extraordinary mercy again to say to them, listen, I know your deceit. I know your contempt. I know your indifference. I know all your excuses, and they had them. They were under the very same pressures that many of us are under. They were living in times when they had to struggle to make ends meet for their families. They were living in times when they were maximized in their energies. They were living in times when round about them there was very little except discouragement for the people of God. They were living in almost identical kinds of contexts to ourselves. And so they were able to point to these things outside of them, the pressures that are upon me, the things I need to do, the stresses in my life. The time isn't yet for me to give myself unreservedly in the service of Jesus Christ and of His kingdom. You remember the famous words of Augustine? Give me chastity, but not yet. And at the end of the day, Haggai is saying, it doesn't really matter where you fill in the word. Give me unreserved consecration to Jesus Christ, but not yet. Give me a desire to worship Him with my whole heart, but not yet. Even more fundamentally, I'll come to this living faith in Jesus Christ about which I have heard for years from this pulpit. I'll do it, but not yet. And Haggai is coming to these people and he is really saying to them, my dear friends, not yet, not today, usually means not ever. For a decade and a half, the temple precincts had been silent and the work of God had not proceeded. That could actually be true of you, couldn't it, as a living temple of God. It could be true of us corporately as a living temple of God. But I'm interested now in the fact that it could be true of you and me as individual temples of God in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, as Paul says. Nothing's been done. The divine tools have been silent. And the zeal you once knew for the glory of God and the house of God and the people of God and the service of God 
the love for Jesus Christ, it's all gone silent. Perhaps that's what's in the envelope for you today. God is saying, I know what you've been saying to me these past years. You've been listening to the ministry of God's Word from the servant of God in this pulpit for over a decade, perhaps. And you've been able to hold it at arm's length, at arm's length, and disdain it, really. And say, if it were different, I would take it. If the time were ripe, I would respond to it. And perhaps today he's handing you the envelope and saying to you, I've known that now, dear child of mine, for years. And I'm coming to you again. And I'm speaking to you personally. Although you're in this company of people, I'm speaking to you personally. And I'm saying to you, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. God God said the people tell him he can wait. My friends, the day comes when he will wait no more. And if you hear his voice, do not delay. Christ, he's the way back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, write your word, we pray indelibly upon our hearts today. Give us grace to respond. For Jesus' sake.